rice is a staple food for more than half the world's population. And that's a major reason that I began working on rice about 20 years ago. Um, because small improvements in farmer productivity in rice can have a dramatic effect on, on feeding a hungry world. And because the population is moving from 6.7 billion now to 9.2 billion uh, by 2050, there is a, a great need to produce uh, more food with the same amount of water on the same amount of land. So rice is grown. Um, virtually on all continents except Antarctica. And it's grown on very small farms and with very simple technology. Rice is uh, often grown in areas that are very extreme environments, including very steep hillsides. This is a hillside in Indonesia. And here's uh, a place in the, in the Philippines just showing you how intensive the farming is. To increase farmers' productivity, farmers need many things. They need uh, infrastructure, they need markets, they he need social and economic support. But there is one thing that they cannot do without, and that is um, rice seed. So this shows you the diversity of rice seed. Just a, an example, there's something like 80,000 varieties of rice seed. Rice has been uh, domesticated for 10,000 years. So there's, uh, these seeds are a, a great source for important traits that are key to farmer productivity, such as resistance to disease, tolerance to droughts, tolerance to different stresses, such as flooding. And so really, to enhance yield, one of the important components for a farmer is seed. So I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about my work on the genetic improvement of rice and describe uh, some, a couple examples of uh, the kinds of uh, difference that, that we can make. So before I go there, I want to uh, describe uh, briefly DNA. So DNA is a component in all our cells and the cells of, of seeds. And actually, DNA is critical for uh, rice productivity because that's where uh, the, the genes are. So DNA. Um, is composed of genes. And I, I, ha I brought some rice DNA along to show you. So what, this, is what we, this is why many people become biologists, because you can pour the ethanol into the salt solution. And then you can do this. And if you look really carefully, it might be hard to see, but you see DNA. So DNA is composed of four nitrogenous bases, sugars, and phosphates. And this is what we call spooling the DNA. So you can simply take a toothpick then and um, pull out the DNA. So that's DNA. And I'm going to pass this around <laughs> to all of you to look at. OK. So what do we do with DNA? So I have been very interested, as many scientists, trying to understand what are the genes that control these important traits. And in particular, my lab is looking at tolerance to disease and tolerance to stress. So I wanted to give you a couple examples. So rice plants get disease as humans get disease. And in particular, we've been looking at a bacterial disease called uh, xanthomonas. So xanthomonas is a very serious plant pathogen. It affects virtually all plants. This particular uh, rice pathogen is called bacterial blight disease of rice. And these little rod-shaped things are the bacteria. And they can enter the rice plant through wounds or natural openings. And then they can multiply in the rice plant. And that can give rise to um, these yellow dewy drops on the surface of the leaf. And this is an infected rice leaf. And you can see there is so much bacterial, it's just oozing out of the rice plant. So what that does, it shows you a rice plant in the field. This is the most serious bacterial disease of rice in Africa and Asia. And in conditions that favor epidemics, it can destroy half the crop. So that is um, very uh, devastating to a small farmer that is living on less than a dollar a day, as many rice farmers are. 
So a number of years ago, and so I should say for 100 years, farmers, uh, breeders have been developing rice plants with tolerance to disease or resistance to disease. But for many years, we didn't know what these genes were. And so about 15 years ago, my lab started studying a, a wild species of rice called Oryza longestaminata from Mali that had been identified from breeders. Um, and we were able to actually isolate the gene that conferred uh, important resistance to this disease, and that gene was called XA21. We isolated it, and we used the process of genetic engineering to introduce this into rice plants. So on the left are uh, conventionally bred rice varieties, and what we do is we take scissors and we dip it into a bacterial suspension, and we just clip the ends of the leaves, and we wait 10 days. And you can see on the left, uh, the rice lines are very susceptible to the disease. And on the right is a rice line that's genetically identical to the one on the left, except it's been genetically engineered with the gene called XA21. And this confers very robust resistance to disease. And uh, this gene now has been introduced into many varieties of rice using both genetic engineering and a, another advanced genetic technique called precision breeding. So I wanted to tell you about another project. And that is, um, we've been working for many years in collaboration with Dave McKill at the International Rice Research Institute on tolerance to flooding. So these are slides of uh, family fields in Bangladesh. These slides were taken just a couple years ago. They've been having severe flooding. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is predicting increased flooding in many parts of the world, including vulnerable low-lying regions like Bangladesh. Their diet is composed of two-thirds of rice. So two-thirds of the diet is rice. So any uh, reduction in product productivity to the rice field is really devastating. So I should say that rice, you think of rice growing in water, and certainly in many places in the world it does grow in water, but it hates to be completely submerged. So if the water covers the rice for more than three days, virtually all rice varieties will die. And so these fields are not going to recover. So this shows you the region um, in the world where most of the world's rice is grown, and 25% and of the rice is grown in flood-prone regions. So it's estimated that in India and Bangladesh alone, 4 million tons of rice, which is enough to feed 30 million people, is lost uh, every year to floods. So a number of years ago, about 50 years ago, some breeders identified um, an unusual variety of rice that was no longer in cultivation in eastern India that had a remarkable ability. It could withstand submergence for two weeks. So breeders have tried through conventional approaches to bring this trait into cultivated varieties. And you need to be aware that in every different region here, farmers have developed uh, varieties that they really, really like. So they taste well, they yield well, they're locally adapted. So when breeders tried to bring in this very valuable trait, they ended up with varieties that the, the, breeder, that the farmers rejected. And often it's because they didn't taste quite right or they didn't perform in these local environments. So, Based on our success with cloning this, um, isolating this gene for resistance, we, dis we embarked on this task in collaboration with his lab and a, and a group at the University of California at Riverside. And we were able to isolate a gene that conferred flood tolerance. And this gene is very interesting. It codes a protein that is a global regulator. So it controls a lot of the rice response to flooding. And we were able to genetically engineer rice in the laboratory to show that we had the right gene and it had this incredible effect. Uh, the plants we developed uh, s survived flooding for two weeks. And then at the International Rice Research Institute, Dave McKill and his colleagues developed um, through precision breeding uh, a process where he was able to introduce this gene into different locally adapted varieties. So you can see the rice are different colors, and um, I'll let you guess uh, which plants lack the submergence tolerance gene. And I just have one more slide. 
that shows you some of the field tests in eastern India and Bangladesh and in farmers fields for three years in the row, row farmers were seeing three to five fold increase in yield. So this just shows the power of genetics and, and the importance of genetic improvement for improving, improving the lives of the poor and malnourished in developing countries. Thank you.